We think that the worship itself is what we're worshiping, but reality is the worship is the external expression when we worship God through singing and instruments and, and the things that we do because we are the living worshipers. We're to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, living worshipers on the altar of God of our time, talent, resources, of who we are because of who he is and what he's already done. So when we offer ourselves as the living worshipers before the, before the Lord, then the things that we do in singing and activating in our lives and, and the actions of our lives or in the instruments, that's the external expression of what we are because we are the living worshipers. And what attract, attracts God's presence is that we would walk in simple obedience to this covenant relationship that we have been so blessed with. Another time he was sharing and, uh, and something he said, he goes, Doug, I was in church and, uh, and he began to just worship God. And he heard the Holy Spirit speak to him and says, why do you worship me? And he's thinking, well, I'm in church. No, why do you really worship me? And he's thinking, well, I'm in church. I'm supposed to be raising my hands and worshiping God and singing with everyone. I'm in church. And then he got it. Why do you really worship me? And he realized that because of his stature as a businessman around the world, he's been in and out of, of offices of prime ministers and presidents and, and lit heads of state, uh, has been a part of helping the original, uh, helping to fund and be a part of the original um, thing that a former president of, of the United States was a part of, which was the uh, reaching the global poor. And, uh, and so he was a part of that. In fact, we were texting back and forth while he was at that gathering here in the United States and on eradicating poverty and helping the global poor. And, and uh, he, he realizes that all these people he knows, it's sometimes he doesn't know who really likes him just because they like him or because they want a business deal. They want money. They, they want something from him. They want a job. They want to do something that has a benefit to them rather than just because of, of the friendship with him. And so when he heard the Lord say, why do you worship me? He gets it. Because do you worship me because of what I can do for you? Because you want something from me? Those are all great things. But those are, again, the result of the fruit of the relationship. What father would give his son or his child or his daughter a, a, a stone if he asked for bread or a serpent if he asked for meat? Our heavenly father already wants to give us this glorious inheritance. Colossians 1.12 is a, is a scripture I love because it says, we give thanks to the father who has qualified us to receive the inheritance. And he goes on to say, because of the son of his love. The son of his love who by all things, the preeminent one by which all things were made to, through, for, and by him. That all principalities and rulerships and kingdoms are subject to him. In other words, it's his authority. He has all authority in all creation. Jesus has the authority. And it's his desire, it says in Ephesians 3.10, that he would give us that manifold wisdom or authority of power to and through the church to speak into the seen and unseen realm. There's something about authority that comes in a relationship with the Lord. Why do you worship me? Not because of what we can get, because he's already done everything. He's our savior. He's our healer. He's our liberator. He's our deliverer. He's our everything. And yes, there's things going on and swirling around us. There's all kinds of noise pollution. And, and, but God's voice is still mightier and louder than all the noise. We've got to learn to hear him and to worship him just because, because, because of who he is and what he's already done for us. Why do you worship me? Is it because you get something from me that there's a benefit that you'll get out of worship? Even Saul was benefiting when Dave was playing the harp. There's something about those who will gather and, and there's something that changes for a moment when they're gathering around a place of corporate worship. But once they get away because their heart has not changed, then they, too, they, they no longer represent the kingdom because they're outside of the presence of the place of God's presence and worship. But true disciples and, and true kingdom people are those who even when no one can see us, it's what we do behind closed doors when no one can even see us but God, that that place is the place of authentic relationship. 
So that when we gather in corporate worship, there is a corporate anointing that is released in that corporate gathering of worship that creates a, 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 a synergistic or an exponential move of God's presence through a congregation, through a people who are in agreement because agreement is the place of power. Why do we worship you, God? We worship you just because, because, because of who you are and what you've already done. I wrote an article a couple of years ago called Inviting God Back in the House. Inviting El back in Bethel. We know Bethel or Bethel means the house of God. But we tend to worship the institution when we need to be worshiping the God of the institution. We need God back in the house. We, we even come to a place where we worship worship. We worship worship leaders. We have celebrity worship even in the church. And what we need is to get past that. See, those are stewards of God's presence and stewards of his anointing. But too often we have propped up the institution or the, the, the act of worship or the act of Christian music or the act of the, the oratorically gifted communicator. We lift up Christian celebrity just like the world and wonder why we're powerless. We need the presence of God. Oh, rend the heavens, oh God. Rend the heavens, oh God. During the Hebrides revivals, Duncan Campbell, who was a part of the revivals, he wasn't actually the one who started the revival. It was actually some praying ladies who just began to pray. And uh, my wife has been to the Hebrides along with some of our uh, Somebody Cares partners, Somebody Cares Aberdeen, Scotland, and others. And they've been there and just kind of met with some people. Actually, were children during the, the Hebrides revival that are way up in their years. But there was, there in the Hebrides, in the 1900s, mid-1900s, in 1948, uh, Duncan Campbell uh, uh, wrote a, a, a little bit about this, but there was actually stories where merchant ships would go past the straits there at the Hebrides, and unbeknownst to them what was happening by the people praying and what God was doing with his manifest presence on the Hebrides, that they would go by and come under deep conviction of, re, of sin. No one even preaching. They just felt this overwhelming conviction as they just went by the Hebrides. There's something about the presence of God that transcends our own human capacity to try to convince people. There's something about God's presence that transcends a, a geographical location. It transcends time. In fact, prayer never falls to the ground. Every idle word never falls to the ground. It's proven that audible sounds and continue to continue even after we hear it, but those sound waves never fall to the ground. That's why when you've got people like praying John Hyde, the son of a Presbyterian minister from Illinois, goes to the Punjab region of India, now parts of Pakistan, he goes there and he begins to pray and he becomes part of the Punjab prayer union, praying every day for God to show up. And those prayers, in fact, I talked to Governor uh, Bobby Jindal when he was governor of Louisiana. I talked to Governor Nikki Haley when she was the governor of South Carolina. And I said, both of you, your families are Hindus, although you've become Christians, but do you know that your family, your heritage comes from the Punjab region of India and modern day Pakistan? And because you have come from the Punjab region, did you know that over 100 plus years ago, there was a prayer movement called the Punjab Prayer Union, and those prayers even today continue to come before the throne of heaven. Every prayer that's ever been prayed, every prayer from a mama, from a papa, from a grandparent, every prayer that has been sown and prayed even times past continue to bombard heaven. And I said, as a result, Governor Haley and Governor Jindal, you become believers today and you become the beneficiaries of those prayers and so many other prayers and friends who've sown seed in your life that, in fact, Bobby Jindal used to tell the story that he was going to, to school and his best friend happened to be a Christian. But before his friend became a Christian, they would you know, do a lot of things together and they'd uh, exchange gifts and birthdays and things like that. And for one of his birthdays, after his friend became a strong Christian, he gave him a Bible with his name engraved on the Bible. Many of us have had Bible's given to us with our names engraved on it. But Bobby Jindal is in a Hindu home, was in a Hindu home. 
And he goes, what am I going to do with that? But he didn't want to reject his friend, and he couldn't get rid of the Bible because his name was on it. So he put it in his closet. And during a difficult time when a family member was going through something, he didn't know what else to do. So the closest thing to God at that moment for him was to pull out the Bible. And he said, I wish my friend would have said to start with the book of John. I just picked it up like a normal book. I went from Genesis going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Oh my. And he goes, he read through the whole thing like a book. But somewhere along the line, he got a revelation of the work of the cross and the power of the resurrection. And God did a work. But see, that's the result of prayers. Just like the, the Hebrides revivals were. And, but here's what Duncan Campbell says. He says that, that revival is a community saturated with God. He also said, and to quote Thomas Chalmers, he said, revival is defined as the impact of the personality of Christ on a community. Too often today, we have a lot of things in the name of Christianity that without Christ. We have a whole lot of things going on, but we're powerless because we're ashamed of using that name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Amen. To this day, I remember when I was not even really serving God, and I was, go I was visiting a church and going to church in Whidbey Island, Washington. I'd just come back from Japan, went to high school there. My Stepdad was in the military, was stationed there. Then we got stationed at Whidbey Island and the Atsugi, I mean, to um, the uh, Oak Harbor uh, Naval Air Station. And I remember being at the church, and that song to this day has never left me. And even in my sin, there was something about that song because the name, it was Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. And in my most difficult of times, even in my sin, I would hear that song. And in my deepest depressions or difficulties, I would hear that song. And I knew there was no other answer but the name of Jesus. I knew that he is the savior, the healer, the liberator, and the deliverer. The book of Acts says when they were told, the apostle says, you can do whatever you want. Call him God, say whatever, but don't use that name. You see, the world doesn't care if we have a form of religion but deny the power thereof. The world doesn't care if we are those who, who, who have a form of Christianity, but they do care when you start standing for the characteristics of the kingdom because the characteristics of the kingdom emanate from the character of the king. Are we more afraid of man? Or are we just in love and in worship of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Jesus, there's something about that name. There is no salvation, there is no healing, there is no freedom without that name. There is no power without that name. But beyond that, even like the seven sons of Sceva, the, the reality is, is this, is that they could endure the name of Jesus, but they had no relationship with Jesus. So that was powerless. In fact, so powerless that the enemy knew how to come against them who were trying to use the name, invoke the name of Jesus, but at the same time had no relationship with Jesus. Because he was trying, and then you had the, the, the Simon the magician who wanted to purchase somehow the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. You can't buy or purchase what is already gifted to us. It's a part of our inheritance. I remember a couple of years ago, I was getting ready for a pastor's, uh, to meet with a pastor early morning, and so the night before I uh, put earplugs in, which I do just so I don't get disrupted, and I have my two prayer times in the morning, I won't get into, but I've shared that before, that every day it's my personal thing, I have two prayer times, my first is my horizontal, where I just thank God, don't ask him for anything, I just say thank you Lord, just because, 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 because I really just wanna worship him without asking him for anything, no supplications, no, no requests, no burdens to him, just God, just thank you. And then after that I do my, 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 my time with the Lord and I'll, I'll take my shower, brush my teeth, and then I'll do my, before I ever leave a hotel room or leave my home, and even through last year, if I was officing out of my office downstairs, before I would leave my room, I had my second prayer time before I started the work day. And that is where I just lay before the Lord, where I'm just on my knees by the bed, and I just say, Lord, I'm way beyond my pay grade. 
There's so many demands on my life that I never thought I'd have. So many needs in the world, and you feel the burden. You, you carry that for your family, friends, and so many others, and things you hear about, the phone calls we get, the emails we get, to late night hours. Yesterday I was on a call with leaders from all of South Africa and other countries because of the increase of crime and, and violence going on in South Africa and Southern Africa. And we were on a conference, uh, we had a conference and I came in through video and was sharing with them yesterday. You carry these birds of Haiti, the Haitian earthquake again yesterday and what's happening still in St. Vincent and the birds that, I just got an email late last night, Doug, can you help us? There's so many kids that can't even have education, they have no laptops, they don't have, they don't have iPads, they don't have, they're, they're having a hard time with all the, the volcanic stuff that they're still evacuated from certain regions and staying in shelters and just there's so many things and so those, that's my prayer time where I, I put all that out my first prayer time but that second one is where I just, God, I have no idea what to do. I need you, Lord. God, I need you. There's something about the presence of God when there's adoration and worship just because, because, because of who he is, in that place of recognizing that we're undone without him, we need the presence of God. So in the midst of all this going on, I was getting up that morning and, and my earplugs in, had to get up early, getting ready to do my horizontal prayer time. But as soon as I'm there, all of a sudden I felt the dog jump up on the bed, my eyes were closed, and that's normal, so the dog comes up by my knees and then I sensed that uh, I, and I felt somebody sit on the bed and I just thought that was my wife trying to check to see if my earplugs in if I was getting up because I had to go to my meeting and, uh, and she'll often just leave me alone because I'll have my hands like this like I'm praying my, which is my first prayer time. But in the midst of that with my earplugs I hear very clearly Zoe. Now I know in the proper vernacular it's Zoe. But we all say Zoe. And so I hear, Zoe. I'm thinking, that didn't even sound like my wife. I opened my eyes and looked. My, there's no wife. She wasn't there, but I felt the presence. The dog wasn't there, but I felt the presence of the Lord. Realized the Lord was trying to say something to me. This is before COVID. And I remember at that moment, I began the next three days, God, what are you saying? What are you saying? And realizing from Genesis and also in Revelation, the Zoe of God is the life, the manifest presence, the life giver of God. He is our life. Jesus is our everything. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. He is the one who gives us salvation and healing and freedom and liberation and deliverance. No other name has the authority that Jesus has. And then through that, I began to process with some of my staff and saying, I feel like the Holy Spirit's saying something. Why does he want us to prepare for the life of God, the Zoe? I know that we, we need, and it was like the Lord was saying, you need to re-engage and understand that all life comes from his presence. There is nothing without him. As I began to read more, I began to realize if you look at Ezekiel 37 and the, and the, and the the dry bones, and then you look at Eutychus in the book of Acts when he falls out of the window and dies, and, and Paul had to go down there and, and, and speak over him, bring, bring him back to life. Those words come from the word zao. Zao comes from the word zoe. Zao means the breath of God. But if you look at Ezekiel 37, it says that the authority is given to us because we already should have a zoe relationship, a life-giving relationship that is reciprocal. We receive this life of Jesus, this life of God, so that when we, God says, now, don't just speak to those bones, prophesy to them. Speak into the situation, prophesy into the situation, because now, because you have the zoe, you have the authority and the right to speak the zao of God, the breath of God to speak the breath of God into the situation. Now, I'm not trying to read into this. I'm just saying this happened all before COVID and realizing that much of the challenges of COVID and, and, the, and the byproduct of that is lung problems and, and people not being able to catch their breath and, and things like that. So God is speaking that, look, I am the life giver. I'm the breath, I'm the life giver and the breath. And I'm giving you my authority to speak breath and life into situations. 
There's something about agreement of prayer, agreeing with God, his spirit, word, character, nature, agreeing with God. But to do that, we have to get in proper alignment with God. We're living not just in the day of Egypt, in, but in a spiritual context, when God was telling through Moses and Aaron to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, here's the reality. It was the largest known empire of the world. Today there is a global, nefarious, diabolical thing. There's a spiritual context that was happening all around the world that's more than just a pandemic. It's more than just certain things that we see here. It's bigger than all that. There is a spiritual context. And I believe that God is saying from our, his people, for me, being overwhelmed and seeing what's going on and picking up God what's going on, God is saying, I want you to focus on me right now. I'm working on these other things. You need to work on our relationship so that you just make sure you're in right alignment with me. So that God in this house is in control. He is the ruler of my house. Spiritually, this temple of the Holy Spirit, but also in my home, in the relationship equities that he's allotted me, the stewardship that he's allotted me. I need to invite God to make sure that he is the ruler of the house. He is the manifestor of the house. David Ravenhill, the son of Leonard Ravenhill, has been a friend for years, and Leonard Ravenhill, as you know, has been uh, uh, like a spiritual grandfather to me when he was alive. And I remember David Ravenhill was speaking at a pastor's gathering that I invited him to, and the son of Leonard Ravenhill. And so David says, if, 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 if I were to invite Doug to be a guest in my home, and I said, mi casa es tu casa, my house is your house, feel, feel comfortable, I mean, just, you're, you're part of the family. And that he and his wife had to go somewhere, and they left me with the keys of the house, even though they said, our house is your house, when they got home, they wouldn't expect that all the walls would be repainted, new paintings on the wall, change of furniture. I wouldn't have the right to change everything because I'm just an invited guest. But if he gave me the deed and title to that home, I have the right to do whatever I want. So the real issue oftentimes is Jesus, our invited guest, that we get to pick and choose when we want him around? Or is he the owner of the title of our home and of our lives? To invite God back in the house is to give him right for his own house. So revival is a community saturated with God. It's the impact of the personality of Christ on a community. And I love it when he says this, it takes the supernatural to break the bonds of the natural. You can make a community mission conscious, you can make a community crusade conscious, but only God can make a community God conscious. Just think about what would happen if God came to any community in power. I believe that day is coming. May we prepare, and may he prepare us all for it. Amen? God, rend the heavens. I've been re-looking at some scriptures like in Psalm 112, verse one through nine, and it reminds us that even in darkness or difficult times, that light, God's light, dawns for the upright. Now, let's look at how we get aligned here. How many of us want to see the light of God in the midst of darkness and difficult times. How many need that in our lives, right? Well, let's just look at some things and how to align ourselves so that God, that we are in that place of under the covering of the blood, just like uh, when the spirit of death came over Egypt, that God's people were, were protected because they're under the blood of the doorposts of their homes. It says, even in darkness, difficult time, or, dif or difficult times, light dawns for the upright. Those who are gracious and compassionate, righteous, generous, lends freely, scatters gift to the poor, gifts to the poor, and walks justly. They will never be shaken, will be remembered forever, has no fear of bad news. I just wanna pause there for a second. Because even in 2015, when I went through my stage four B-cell lymphoma cancer, um, it was bad news. But what makes us different than what the world does in fear? Because we're a people of faith, not a people of fear. My spiritual father was the late doc, Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole who wrote Maximize Manhood. I get still serve on the Global Fatherhood Initiative and Christian Men's Network that he founded and, and, uh, and Dangerous Nations. But he used to say this, faith 
is believing those things you cannot see will come to pass. Fear is believing those things you cannot see will come to pass. They sound exactly the same, but they're two different meanings because one, faith is the kingdom of God and light. Fear is the kingdom of darkness of the devil, but they both try to promise you that those things you cannot see will come to pass. If we're people of faith, then faith is believing those things we cannot see are still going to come to pass, and so we don't operate out of the spirit of fear, which is of darkness, but the, fear, the spirit of faith that comes from God and his Holy Spirit through his son, Jesus Christ. Two totally different, they sound the same. How many have ever watched the news and, and you can see different newscasters and they all say the same words, but they mean something totally different. What we need is to hear the voice of the Lord like never before. And so those, we, we, don't, we, we don't walk in fear of bad news. Our heart is steadfast. We trust God. Our heart is secure. There's no fear. And we will triumph and his horn will be lifted high in honor. See, when God steps down and lightning comes, the lightning of God's presence, all these other things are scattered. We need to be in the presence of God, amen? Another thing as I was thinking about is what has become known and talking about the seven deadly sins. Let me just read those to you. Although there's not a direct scripture that speaks of these particular seven, there's many scriptures that infer these same seven, but become known as the seven deadly sins. The seven, and it's become a part of Christian tradition. The seven deadly sins are this, lust, gluttony, greed, slothfulness, wrath, envy, and pride. And there's many, many scriptures that correlate to this. For example, lust is a strong passion or longing, especially for sexual desires. And the Bible speaks in 2 Timothy 2.22 about lust, Flee all youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And we can go through every one of those. I don't want to go through them, but I do want to just give us a proverb that God does speak to us about, the six things, yes, even seven that God hates. And that is this, a proud look. It says in Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil. Six, a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows, sows discord among the brethren. We see today so many, even in the church, that have been so divided. When we think about the Jewish historian Josephus, who actually saw and lived out the destruction of Jerusalem and the desecration of the temple in 70 AD. As a Jewish historian, he saw all these things. But here's what he observed, that there was already uh, people, Jewish homes that were divided politically, divided in, in their personal walk. They were all arguing and fighting. There was divisiveness. There was an extortion of strength because they were divided amongst themselves to the point they were off balance so that Rome, when they came in, could actually do what they did to desecrate the temple and destroy Jerusalem. And we see today that we see so many even families divided over political lines and, and, and denominational lines and ethnic lines. We see this increase of Luke 21 where we see wars and rumors of wars. We see, we see earthquakes and famines and pestilence and pandemics and, and tsunamis. And we see all these crazy things that are happening and increasing. But in the midst of that, Luke 21 speaks of all these negative things that would come. In Jesus' own words, he says, but... And he's speaking in verse 13 to the church. But it shall be an occasion for your testimony. See, people of faith, we observe, it rains on the just and the unjust, but we recognize that in the midst of all the craziness going on, it's our moment of opportunity to let the light of Christ shine in us in such a way that it draws others to him. We don't run off into our holy huddles we don't run off back into the mountains somewhere to hide away. We know that the, the book ends with all of us, we win. I was talking to a, a mutual friend, I'm sure, of, of pastors of mine. His, Kevin Harrison used to be the vice president uh, at, uh, at, at Southwestern Assembly of God University. Then later he pastored in Waco. He's pastored in, in uh, Baltimore. And so we've been friends for many, many years. And, uh, and now he's the president, 
of, of an online Bible school called West Coast Bible College and Seminary. Well, his son-in-law is one of the world top runners and ran in the Olympics. Now, he was disappointed, the fact that he didn't get any medals. But his perspective is this, look, we're going after this gold medal that the streets of gold are already laid out with. And he's still considered one of the fastest in the world. Just so happens that it just didn't work out at the Olympics, but he's still, by the end of the year, could still be number one or two in the world in the things that he runs. And so he's, we had him on a podcast interview recently. It'll air tomorrow. And, and uh, just hearing his story and his faith was amazing to me. But he recognized in the midst of all the challenges, he's still running a race that he already gets to win. Because in Christ, we win. We run the race in such a way to win because in Christ we already win. I don't know why I'm getting this a picture of, 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 uh, of, of, of the movie um, Run, Forest, Run, you know, Forrest Gump. It's like, you know, with, with God behind us, we can run, Doug, run, and we win. It's already spoken. We are winners. We're not losers. We're the head. We're not the tail. But we've got to recognize that what is it in me that is not in alignment so that I can make sure that I'm under God's covering and there's not a breach of his covering in the midst of a world that's going through what it's going through. For me to be the greatest witness, I have to make sure that my life is aligned with God, that I'm aligned with his word, character, nature, and spirit. God, if there's any pride in me, God, if there's anything where I have a deceitful tongue, if I've been slandering, if I've gossiped or murmured, or if I've done any of these things, where well, we see that in 1 Corinthians 10, the five deadly sins of the desert, which really fits the seven deadly sins. One is lust. Second, idolatry, which is anything that masters or possesses our affections more than Jesus. Three is sexual immorality or sex sins. We shouldn't need a dictionary to figure that out. And fourth is the place of, of tempting Christ, where we say we're Christians, but we live like the world. That's a tempting of Christ. And then the fifth is one that's like a spiritual immune deficiency disease. It's where cells of the body destroy other cells of the body. Instead of building each other on the faith, we're undermining each other. There's a seditious spirit. And oftentimes, it's not Jezebel. We give Jezebel a lot of credit. But Jezebel is an external kingship or rulership that is with an emasculated husband who should be ruling for God's people, but has acquiesced his authority to, a, to Jezebel who worships Baal. And it, oftentimes, we give Jezebel the credit for what's going on, but the reality is it's an Absalom spirit. They're both seditious, undermining God's constituted authority. That creates a breach of covering. Sometimes it's those like King David said, I could have handled the pressure and the attacks if it had been an enemy, but it turned out to be a friend. It's painful when the ones you expected to be a part of your life story are just a part of a chapter of your life. It's painful when people you thought would go with you, but they're not. It's painful because a lot of times they leave out of their envy or jealousy or disappointments or like Joseph's brothers that because he was sharing this dream and they get upset with them. Sometimes even Leonard Ravenel used to tell me things, says, Doug, I'm gonna share some things I believe God has for you in your life, but it's not time to talk about it publicly because people won't understand. There are sometimes God will speak things to you that it's not for you just to go tell everybody. It's things to ponder in your heart. The God who gives the promise will fulfill it. Amen? Amen? Murmuring and backbiting, that seditious spirit destroys what God is trying to do. He tries to do in congregations, tries to do through the church, tries to do. And so we see the church is being divided uh, on racial lines and political lines and, and families are being divided on racial lines and political lines and denominational lines. What we need to do is get back to fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name. There's no salvation, healing, liberation, deliverance without that name. And then, as become known as the seven virtues, it counteracts the seven deadly sins or the sins of, of the desert where a whole, God's intention was all of Israel should enter the promised land. Should have taken 11 to 14 days, took them 40 years, and, and had a whole generation to die out before they came in or in. For there was that second circumcision, so to speak. And Moses didn't even get to enter in. 
I tell young people all the time that ask me to help mentor them, so if you promise me this, that when you enter into your kingdom or your promised land, don't bury me on this side of the river. I wanna go with you. But the seven virtues originally was defined in a poem by, um, by a Christian governor who died around 410 AD. And uh, here's the seven virtues that have become incorporated in, in Christian uh, tradition. Kindness cures envy by placing the desire to help others above the need to supersede them. Two, temperance cures gluttony by implanting the desire to be healthy, therefore making one fit to serve others. Three, charity or love cures greed by putting the desire to help others above storing up treasure for oneself. Four, chastity or self-control cures lust by controlling passion and leveraging that energy for the good of others. Humility cures pride by removing one's ego and boastfulness, therefore allowing the attitude of service. Diligence or zeal cures slothfulness by placing the best interest of others above the life of ease and relaxation. Dr. Evan Lewis Cole used to say that love desires to give at the expense of self, whereas lust desires to get at the expense of others. In seven, patience cures wrath by taking time to understand the needs and desires of others before acting or speaking. So there is a way by which the world is operating under a certain spirit, these deadly sins, and we see, and my wife and I were just talking about this driving here from Houston, that there's so many things we don't understand. And it's overwhelming because there's so many voices out there and, 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 and what you should do and where are we gonna, nobody has, seems to have an answer. But there is an answer is that we don't walk in fear, we walk in faith. The answer is that we as God's people recognize that this is an opportunity in the midst of what seems, uh, it's hard to comprehend, it's humanly uh, uh, impossible to comprehend, and yet in the midst of that, God says, but it should be an occasion for your testimony. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So for me, it's getting back to just telling the story. Because those who tell the story define the narrative and create the history. What history is our life storytelling? At the end of the day, if I have, it's like when I went through the cancer in 2015, thank God I'm, I'm still uh, cancer free, but to the chagrin of some and to the amazement of others. But even in the midst of that, I said, if I had one day or if I have 100 more years, I'm gonna live every day by the grace of God as unto the Lord and to be a witness for him. I can sit in my circumstance, sit on a chair and have a pity party and the devil wins. We can't let the devil win in the midst of what's going on. We have to get up from that place and we can't wait for the angel to move the water at the pool of Bethesda. The water is already moving. Let's get in the water where the water is fine and God is going to do a work that only God can do. We can't do it, but he can. And if we are truly his people, all we can do is get to the place of recognizing where have I allowed a breach in my life and where then I can come with an opposite spirit to walk in the covering of God, the protection of God, the authority of God, the power of God, and the commission of God because it's the anointing of God that breaks the yokes of bondage. How many know that we need breakthroughs today? Jesus, our king, is still the master of breakthroughs. He is still the healer. Every morning in my prayer, I said, God, I, Jesus, I thank you that you are my savior and my healer. And I thank you, Lord, that you're my healer and deliverer spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, and relationally. God, you are my healer and my deliverer in all these ways. And Lord, where I have failed you, where I have failed people, God, let your grace abound. Forgive me, Lord, but show me where I can get in a place of, of fine-tuning that place of my relationship because I want to be that living worshiper. And I want to walk in simple obedience to you, which is the highest form of worship. Without that, we have nothing. I don't want to worship him in form. I don't want to worship him just because uh, of what I can get from him. I want to worship him. Even as Paul says, I want to learn how to pray without ceasing. I want my heart to adore and worship God in the midst of whatever is going on. And that's not always easy. But I know this one thing. 
that he, if he truly lives in me, he is still greater than he is of this world. If he truly lives in me, then I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. For Christ in us, the hope of glory. Holy Spirit, I pray, even this morning you remind us that you're still working in our behalf. And we worship you just because, because, because of who you are and what you've already done for us. Would you rend the heavens, oh God? Would you pour out your spirit in a fresh way in our individual lives, our families, this congregation, the church at large, God? God, there's so many things that can be so overwhelming that our hearts become overwhelmed and stressed and full of anxiety. But God, we know this one thing that we can cast our cares upon you for your burden is light and your yoke is easy. God, I pray for salvation and healing for those we've been praying for. God, it, it's heartbreaking to see what's happening to the church across this nation and around the world. It's heartbreaking to see the lives that are scattered, still shipwrecked in the sea of despair. But thank you, Lord, that you've called us to be part of your kingdom. And you're the king of your kingdom. And you live in us. Pour out your spirit, oh God. Pour out your spirit. Can I ask a question as we close? If you're here today, and I, I never have people bow their heads. God is doing a work. We've been praying for revival. Revival's here. But let me ask you a question, because I never allow people to bow their heads at this moment, because there's too many of us that can hide behind our compensatory facades. Our, we compensate on the outside for the lack on the inside. But God wants a people that are honest with him that he can part his spirit upon. If you're here this morning, maybe you're a guest or maybe you've been serving God, but there's areas of your life that you know you've allowed these deadly sins to captivate you, fear to captivate you. But today you're just saying, look, I don't know how to do it, but I know God does. I just wanna be honest with God. Because that's where we start with honesty with God. God's able to do what only he can do. If there is areas of sin in your life, lust or idolatry, sexual morality, tempting Christ, murmuring, backbiting, maybe you've been going through the form of worship, but yet we need to get back to just simple obedience to God. If that's you here this morning, unashamedly, on the count of three, if you're saying, there are things I want to get off of me right now. I want them out of my life. I'm just giving them to the Lord this morning. It's God's grace. It's going to work through this, but I want it out of my life so I can leave here liberated and free in Jesus' name. So on the count of three, if there's things in your life you know that are not pleasing to God. And the good thing is we don't have to expose what those things are. Right now, we just want to get honest. So if there's things in your life you know that are displeasing to God on the count of three, I'm gonna have you stand with me so we can pray for God's fresh anointing upon your life. One, two, three. Is there anyone? Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe for some, this is your first time ever publicly acknowledging that Jesus is the answer for your life, is Lord of your life. Others, you've walked this journey, but sometimes walking the journey, we, get, we become weary we go through routine, but this is a time for fresh anointing right now. Would you put your hand on your heart with me? And would you pray, and pray like you mean it? Say, Lord Jesus, come on, like you mean it. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins and the things I've done that have broken your heart and brought shame to your name. Right now, by faith, I give you the right to change my mind, change my heart, change my life for you are king you are lord you are savior you are healer and you are the deliverer in jesus name and right now by faith i receive into my spirit a fresh anointing of the presence of god a fresh revelation of the work of the cross and the power of the resurrection in Jesus' name. Let's begin to thank the Lord right now where you are. Sing this with me. Sing Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about
But there's something about that name. Father, thank you for being in this house today. Thank you for the name of Jesus. We thank you for Doug Stringer, Lord God. Bless and minister in a powerful way to him. Let his organization just meet every need according to your riches and glory that they need. We thank you, Lord God, for what the word has been spoken to us today. May it be good soil. May we be good soil to receive that seed planted. We pray, Lord God, we would walk in the glory and the blessing of what you have done for us today. In Jesus' and precious and holy name, if you need to begin that walk in a serious way, I want you to touch base with our director of discipleship, Michael Derrick. Michael has his hand up in the air right there. If you want to know how to walk this walk, he's the guy to talk to. we got a brand new class coming up real soon. I look forward to seeing you Wednesday night or next Sunday morning. God bless you. Have a great day.